Hello, greetings to all of you and welcome to this ADB seminar on the graduation approach in the context of resettlement. Now, the graduation approach to poverty and vulnerability reduction has been successfully applied in development practice for over the past decade. And we know that there is overwhelming evidence about its positive effect. Now, at the same time, we also know that this approach um, can have different effects depending on the context. So it's very context specific, but also on the nature of specific social and economic vulnerabilities um, of people it tries to serve, as well as their, their prior endowment. Now, the question is, um, in what circumstances and for which groups this approach is the most successful um, development tool? Now, today, we'll be trying to answer some uh, this question and we'll be looking at a particular target group. So these are people who have been resettled. Um, they, they can be resettled due to economic development projects um, or they could be resettled forcefully due to conflict and violence. So we'll be looking at, at both groups here. And our speakers today uh, will discuss some of the innovative features of uh, specific graduation projects that they, they, they led, they experienced, um, and to extent to which these interventions were successful in addressing specific vulnerabilities of resettled populations. So we'll, we'll, they will discuss the, the context, the specific vulnerabilities of, uh, of the target populations and uh, and, 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 and findings of their interventions to date. Now, uh, I'm going to give you the order of our speakers today um, so that you have an idea about the, the structure of, of, of our webinar. And I will introduce the speakers um, in more detail near just before their, uh, their presentation. So we have today Palak Raval um, framing the overall approach. Uh, Maria Benildeci, Redaha, um, uh, talking about the Malolos Clark project in the Philippines. Um, we have Ricardo Barba. He, he will share his experience in, um, in the Tamil Nadu project. Shoshana Hecker uh, will discuss the experience of uh, resettlement in uh, uh, forced resettlement um, and the graduation approach applied to those contexts. And our discussant, Ode Montesquieu, will, um, will, will, will provide uh, will facilitate um, questions and answers and will, uh, will facilitate a, a panel discussion. Now, in the meantime, please do share your questions to the speakers. Um, and you can do this by um, typing your questions in the Q&A box, which you can find at the bottom of your screen. And when you pose your question, please state your name, uh, your organization and, and, and specify if your question is directed to a specific speaker. Also, uh, you, can, you can interact with us on, on X, formerly known as Twitter, uh, and use the, the, um, as a hashtag SPORG webinar, um, uh, and, and that's how you can, you can communicate with us on Twitter. So, so that much for the housekeeping, and, uh, and now I'm going to turn to our first speaker, Palak Raval. So um, Palak Raval is social development specialist at ADB, um, and she, she works at ADB on social protection programs, including graduation programs. Um, prior to ADB, Palak worked with the World Bank and where she supported um, design implementation and knowledge generation on gender sensitive social protection, but she's also had intensive engagement in um, graduation or economic inclusion programs um, uh, in India um, uh, and uh, globally. And now uh, over to you, Palak. Thank you so much, Bob. Uh, and hello, everyone. Over the next eight minutes, I will try to provide a quick overview of the graduation approach and then specifically in the context of resettlement and displacement, including the vulnerabilities and barriers faced by affected households and how the graduation approach provides a unique model to rebuild economic and social welfare in this context. 
ADB's framework for the graduation approach, or what we also call social protection for economic inclusion, is based on the understanding that poverty is multidimensional and therefore requires a holistic and integrated approach, which includes five key components. The first, social protection, to support basic income security and meet immediate needs, such as through cash and in-kind transfer and access to health and education. Second, livelihoods promotion, consisting of a grant, asset, or employment pathway that is based on a localized market assessment and is supported with technical skills training to grow and manage that livelihood. Third, financial inclusion, which aims to ensure access to formal financial services and savings accompanied by financial literacy training. Fourth, social empowerment, through the life skills training that coaches provide on key social and health issues and community mobilization and strengthening. And fifth, the cross-cutting pillar of coaching and mentorship through household visits and regular check-ins by field staff that provide tailored psychosocial support, help in monitoring progress and reinforcing key messages from these trainings. Together, these five pillars provide a ladder out of extreme poverty into sustainable livelihoods. Graduation programs are time bound and sequenced on average for a period of about 18 to 36 months. There is rigorous evidence on the programs showing positive impact across diverse contexts, geographies, target groups, and over periods of time on multiple parameters such as increased access to income, savings, assets, positive behavior change, to name a few. These results last not only immediately after the program, but up to seven or 10 years after the programs have ended as seen in studies in Bangladesh and India respectively. The returns on investment for every dollar spent on the program is substantial, ranging from 1.3 times in Ghana to 4.3 times in India. As mentioned, graduation programs are carefully sequenced over the period of 18 to 36 months to provide holistic support. And this is a glimpse of what that sequence may look like. ADB is supporting multiple graduation programs in the Asia Pacific region. We've completed three programs in the Philippines and currently in different stages for other programs. We're implementing the graduation approach in diverse contexts, including focusing on climate resilience, youth employment, emergency recovery, and sustainable tourism, to name a few. One unique integration of the approach is in the context of project-induced resettlement, which you will hear more about from our case studies in India and the Philippines. Now, development projects often involve involuntary resettlement impacts. Further, forced displacement due to conflict or war also leads to significant relocation. Resettlement and displacement come with specific vulnerabilities and barriers faced by affected households. These include physical relocation to a new area, often far away from their existing homes, a loss of livelihoods or employment and access to assets such as livestock or vending shops, a loss of community and social ties because people leave behind their current social settings, this can have deep psychosocial and psychological impact on families due to isolation and lack of support mechanisms. It can also lead to a lack of access to basic services such as health, education, and transport. In the long term, it creates hardship for affected families, preventing them from rebuilding their lives. And for resettlement projects specifically, it can lead to a lack of occupancy in the resettled sites. Typically, resettlement programs by governments or organizations often overemphasize the cash or in-kind entitlement to compensate for the inventory of losses without sufficiently addressing the economic and social impact on households. These entitlements are often based on the these entitlements are often not based on the requirements of the households to rebuild their lives, such as to start a feasible income generating activity. They may also not take into account the differentiated vulnerabilities of the target group who had little to begin with, thereby often lacking an integrated and tailored package of support. Currently, there is strong and widespread evidence on graduation programs globally, including for refugee populations, which we will hear about. However, there is limited evidence on applying the graduation approach in a project-induced resettlement context. Our case studies from India and the Philippines hope to bridge such gap in literature. 
To respond to and address the vulnerabilities in resettlement, graduation approach provides a unique model to rebuild economic and social welfare for households in the new sites. It builds on existing resettlement programs to provide a holistic support across the five pillars. While programs may provide a one-time or monthly allowance to relocated families, graduation adds to it through a landscaping and resource planning to identify the basic services in the new sites and establish linkages for participants after they resettle. Resettlement programs may also have a one-time livelihood grant for asset or seed capital. Graduation interventions add to it through a localized market assessment to identify the most feasible income generating activity, conduct a tailored household livelihood matching support, and provide technical skills training and employment linkages as applicable. Resettlement programs also provide access to savings and low interest loans. Graduation interventions add value by developing a transition plan for savings group in the new sites, providing regular savings and loan facilitation in the new sites, as well as delivering financial literacy training to increase access to savings. Resettlement programs have welfare committees for the households, while graduation programs may add value through life skills training on key social and health issues and to strengthen the community towards a positive behavior change. Resettlement programs also entail a general oversight by staff, while graduation interventions provide tailored coaching and mentoring through targeted household visits to monitor progress, reinforce messages from trainings, and support in addressing challenges that households face thereby providing a comprehensive model to support households thrive in the new sites. ADB is increasingly contributing to literature in the area. We recently published a working paper last year to explain the detailed and contextualized design of how to integrate the graduation approach in resettlement planning in Tamil Nadu, India, which you will hear more about from Ricky. We also have other policy briefs and technical notes on the graduation approach, which you can check out on our website. I'll end here and look forward to hearing from the case studies ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Balad. Now that you, you framed the, uh, the, the, the webinar for us and we know more about the graduation approach and we also know about the, the particular vulnerabilities that arise in the context of resettlement, we can move on with our main case studies. So the first case study will be presented by Maria Benilde Chi Ridaha. Um, so Chi is a team leader of Malolos Clark project in the Philippines. Uh, she's a development practitioner with over 30 years experience working in uh, poor and marginalized communities in the Philippines. And she has led the um, Malolos Clark Railway Project, which is um, called Strengthening the Transition of Vulnerable Communities Project. Um, and currently she's leading the second follow-on project. Um, again, uh, th that is um, dedicated to supporting um, resettled populations. Now she's, she's managed various programs throughout her entire career. And one of the most notable is the Philippines Community-Driven Development Program, Kalahi Seeds, which she, she managed as part of the Philippines Department of social welfare and development. Now, uh, I'm uh, passing it over to you, Chi. Thank you, Bob. Um, there you go. So good afternoon, everyone. May I know if you can see the screen? Yes, we can see the screen. All right, then, thank you. So uh, the SDVC, or the Strengthening the Transition of Vulnerable Communities Affected by the Malolos Clark Railway Project, is a TA grant to the Philippine uh, Department of Transportation uh, by the Japan Fund for Prosperous and Resilient Asia and 
the Pacific through the Asian Development Bank. And it was implemented from 2020 to 2023. Uh, the actual GA implementation occurred for about 30 months. No? And the objective was to assist 1,250 most vulnerable households to achieve sustainable livelihoods by applying the adapted uh, GA. STVC was intended to support the Philippine government uh, in addressing the impacts of resettlement on vulnerable households facing displacement because of the construction of the Malolos Clark Railway project. The impacts um, are, are, I guess, very similar to other resettlement areas, no? Um, physical displacement, loss of shelter, disruptions, and uh, loss of livelihoods and income, uh, disruptions in social ties, access to services, and um, what we found out, no? Heightened uh, insecurities and anxieties among affected populations. This was against the backdrop of a protracted uh, pandemic that led to widespread unemployment and slowdown in the uh, economy. We designed a package of assistance uh, to strengthen access to social services, health, nutrition, um, education, um, and, and access um, a range of support from both the local government units and the national government agencies. And they included um, emergency assistance uh, for medical needs, assistive devices for PWDs, uh, and other interventions, uh, including those involving uh, cases of violence against women and children. We enrolled eligible households to social pension and other programs for indigent populations and uh, facilitated their application for government IDs which uh, these IDs are very important to uh, the affected households because they are needed to apply for resettlement compensation and other entitlements. We link households to financial services, no? and uh, these are with microfinance uh, institutions that are operating in the area, provided training and coaching on financial literacy, livelihoods, and mobilize and strengthen their participation in homeowners association. Those interested to develop livelihoods were linked to livelihood agencies for assets transfer and for advisory and business development uh, services. The DOTR's Livelihood Restoration and Improvement Program provided us with a platform to coordinate um, assessment of needs, provision of technical skills training, uh, trade certification, and access to other appropriate services. The uh, individual household cases are being managed by our 50 trained field mentors who work with the DOTR resettlement officers or case handlers to provide more focused support uh, as indicated in their household intervention plan, which were developed by the households prior to their employment, uh, enrollment in the program. Our retention rate at project end was 97% and 84% have successfully met the outcomes from uh, applicable graduation uh, intervention. In terms of opportunities, I think three are important to mention. No? One is that basic services in the Philippines are already fully devolved. This meant that uh, there, these services uh, are, are more prompt. No? They, they reach the households um, and the cost of accessing them in terms of transport, in terms of time, is significantly lower. Second, there are many available forms of livelihood assistance being delivered by livelihood agencies and NGOs. And there's a huge opportunity to pull this together and expand the resource envelope for affected uh, households. 
third, many of the agencies have actually demonstrated their willingness to make the rules more flexible, providing the option of uh, community-based skills training, for example, uh, and extending more individualized coach coaching on business development. In terms of challenges, I will also mention three, uh, and perhaps one of the biggest we encountered was survey fatigue, because at that time there were, other than the DOTR, there were other agencies uh, doing surveys you now with, uh, with communities. And this led to refusals by many households to be surveyed and inaccurate and incomplete responses that resulted to many back and forth in validation. And what uh, compounded <clears throat> this problem was also uh, the restrictions that were in effect because of the COVID pandemic. Second, while NGAs were willing to adjust the rules for providing cash grants for livelihoods, there was often one condition that's um, tied to the status of their resettlement. And households need to be fully resettled before they could be given uh, or extended the cash grants by national government agencies. In some cases, we were able to negotiate for them to extend the cash grant by uh, requesting certification from the DOTR that you know this group of households are due for relocation in these areas. So, so it's kind of a guarantee. Second, uh, third, um, by the way, is actual relocation proceeded uh, rather slowly and it was hobbled by many issues, including lack of available lands and the challenge of coordinating the pre-qualification of beneficiaries, um, LGU sign off to resettlement decisions. This delay many times limited the opportunities available to households. It's also connected to the second point. For instance, credit services among MFIs require that households um, should have already established the residency in the resettlement site six six months to a year no, before they could avail of the services. It also increased the level of anxiety of households uh, who wanted immediate assurance um, about their resettlement fate before they could firm up their, uh, their plans. So uh, that in a nutshell is the experience of uh, the Philippines in the Malolos Clark Railway project. We are using many of these lessons uh, in um, implementing the next SDVC for the South. Thank you. Back to you, Bob. Very much, T. Um, and of course, we'll find out more about this project and other project, our case study projects during the, the moderated discussion. And as I said, uh, please feel free to post your questions. And um, if you wish to, to learn more about lessons learned as well as it, the, the key um, challenges and opportunities. Now, our next, next speaker is Ricardo Barba, and he will talk about his experience uh, of the um, India's Namil Ta Na Tamil Nadu uh, project. Ricardo is Principal Safeguard Specialist at the Asian Development Bank. He's the officer in charge of safeguards implementation in two regions, South Asia and Southeast Asia. And he's got extensive experience and is processed and implemented urban development and housing projects in a number of countries, including Bhutan, India, uh, Maldives, Sri Lanka, and some others. Um, and he also has acted as project administration unit head in the Bhutan resident mission. Uh, and as I said, Ricardo will talk about the uh, India's uh, Tamil Nadu project. Over to you, Ricardo. Thank you very much, Bob. And I'll ask Paula to um, share the screen. Um, next slide, please, Paula. Um, and um, while that next slide is coming up, here it is. I'd like to, um, you know, extend um, my thanks for the people who worked on this project. First of all, I was the mission leader, so I was not the safeguard specialist, Saswati Balyapa was, but we got a lot of help. I see uh, many people in the audience who I might pass on, such as Karen or Lainey, um, on NGO support and social protection. But most importantly, you'll see overlaps in my presentation with Palak's slides. And the, the very important secret to that is because Palak actually worked on this project as well. So I'm uh, very, I, I'm in very much good hands. If you have questions, they can also help me answer in the chat box. 
Anyway, the Tamil Nadu project is a project that is still under construction. Let me say that there are three um, components. The first component is where we apply the graduation program. It's actual construction of affordable housing. This affordable housing is meant to remove people from climate hazard prone areas. For example, in the banks of waterways where flooding uh, affects them negatively and causes them to be relocated temporarily and then they go back. Um, and this cycle is, is, is disruptive to their lives so that this actually creates um, a, an opportunity to move them to safer locations. So this is the resettlement that happened in the project. If you can imagine, we're moving them to safer locations. But of course, that comes with all the disruptions that happen when you are relocated. You would also understand from the project that these are informal settlers and therefore they have most of the vulnerabilities that we often encounter in development projects even though um, not all are in this scale of relocation. I saw a question on the chat box which I will you know attempt to answer by by experience I'm also a safeguard specialist not just a mission leader so um, why did we take this idea of using the graduation approach? And this idea is really because as safeguard specialists, um, we, we undertake resettlement planning to address the risks of impoverishment. In some ways, um, Palak's presentation showed that, but just to refresh people's memories, um, impoverishment happens um, in, in the form of these risks. Landlessness, joblessness, homelessness, marginalization, food insecurity, increased mortality, morbidity, loss of access to common property resources and services, and social disarticulation. These are what underlies the objectives of all resettlement planning. And if you can see, when we looked at the graduation experience, these were led by Karen in the past, and, and she's also here. She can probably help me answer questions. We note that all of this is actually addressed in the graduation programs that she was implementing in some form or another. And that's why we collaborated in some sense with them to see the examples and see how it can be applied to resettlement. So we are looking at this in the first component. The other components of the project are using a financial intermediary for uh, migrant workers, housing, and also urban planning. But on the first component, which is actual construction, we have a target to pilot the graduation approach in resettlement for 1,700 households. So basically, as Palak had shown in her slide, and maybe I can move to the next slide, we work with the Tamil Nadu Urban Habitat Development Board, which is tasked to relocate um, houses to safer locations, among other things. And we basically looked at how we would have put together a resettlement plan. So I, I know the question in the chat box. This has to be done in together. So this is actually a design. Uh, because there are things that overlap, which is well and good. There are also things that are different in terms of time. Um, so you need to have had this framework in mind before you launch your resettlement planning. We looked at, as you know, for resettlement planners out there, for social safeguard specialists out there, resettlement planning is usually based on the capacity of the, um, the agency and also the experience they have implementing ADB projects. So Tamil Nadu is, a, is an important client for ADB. Tamil Nadu has fixed resettlement planning history, if you may say so. And that's why I put together this slide, which is coming also from a, a slide that Palak presented. But this is an actual example. Let me um, direct you to the right, right side of the slide, the livelihood assistance. So a traditional resettlement plan would have livelihood assistance because that's very important to combat the risk of um, joblessness and um, in food insecurity, etc. And so there is a livelihood assistance package of 50,000 rupees. Uh, to translate that, that would be a little more than $500, right? Um, and a third is also provided in terms of technical training. So there is an asset package. There is training. But more often than not, as Palak had explained, it's cash-based. So that is basically what is being focused on. On the other hand, using the graduation approach, we add on to that in terms of the green box below. So there's market and skills assessment, household level livelihood matching to skills, resources, and interest, tailored specialized trainings, professional vocational employment linkages for youth. What this does is actually improve the livelihood asset package. 
what um, has been done is to survey the host location. So there's a sending and a receiving site. The receiving site is surveyed in terms of what are the needs. The households are surveyed in terms of what they already have in terms of skills, what needs to be supplemented, right? Um, and so the market and skills, skills matching will give you an understanding of what relevant training there will be and which which uh, members of the household should be trained. For example, there was a attention here for youth. Um, so that, in a sense, ensures that the resettlement planning component of delivering livelihood is done in a time-bound and much more, um, much more targeted, directed, and more effective uh, methodology. Next slide, please. Thanks. So just, just through um, a quick survey of um, what we found so far, um, we are able to integrate the graduation approach in the resettlement context. We're building on safeguards plan and actually policies of the governments and improving them. What is important is that the government is on board on this. There is no actual grant to develop this. This is part of the loan. They're actually piloting graduation with with our intent that this would be used in all of their um, relocations. I think it's a unique value addition, um, but there are the challenges. Um, there's uh, an issue of building the capacity and we had built the capacity during planning. Now during implementation, we have to resource it, ensure that um, it's resourced. Um, and that is specific to the graduation program, um, close, being close to the, sorry, let me backtrack. We we need to ensure that the design is refined prior to the relocation relocation date. And consultation is really the key, not different from any resettlement implementation. I'm sorry, I'm conscious of the time. That's why I'm looking at my timer. And um, you know, the government is doing this from the for the first time, and it's very important to build their capacity. I think I have one slide left just to explain where we are. So this is the current construction. Um, so we're near, nearly doing the construction. We have done a lot of consultations. Upfront, we have been sensitizing communities on how the graduation program will be implemented. I, I want to um, highlight something that I cannot highlight in this presentation is that actually the graduation program informed how the resettlement sites would be structured. We found a need for livelihood centers, you know, where they can be trained, where they can provide um, uh, markets so that they can capitalize on host communities as their market. So we're building market sites, green areas, open spaces, training sites, et cetera, within the housing co complex. That's my timer. So I feel that the graduation program has indeed been a good value addition in how we are undertaking this resettlement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ricky. And so with these two case studies, we, we have now focused on the context where resettlement was driven mainly by economic development needs. Um, what we'd like to do next is focus on the, 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 the forced resettlement context, so, so where the resettlement is mainly driven by, uh, by conflict, violence, and invite our next speaker, Shoshana Hecker, to um, talk about her experience. Shoshana is Senior Director of Refugee Affairs at Trickle Up. Trickle Up is a, an international uh, non-profit organization that is dedicated to um, promoting inclusion of marginalized people, especially women. Uh, so Shoshana is responsible for um, oversight of Trickle Up's fourth displacement portfolio, which includes um, leading on displacement refugee strategy development, managing key partnerships, providing technical oversight, particularly for graduation and economic inclusion programming. Um, and she has um, been working in development for the past 20 years in various aspects and particularly supported livelihood and economic inclusion programs uh, globally, um, including countries in Asia, such as Indonesia, Nepal, Mongolia, um, Timor-Leste, but she also worked in Jordan, Colombia, Kosovo, and Uganda, among others. Um, nice to have you here, Shoshana. It is over to you. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm very pleased to be here and share a little bit about um, Trickle Up's experience working um, in displacement contexts. Um, right. 
Um, so Triple Up was started in 1979. We're really focusing on people who um, have often been excluded um, from programming. Um, and then so that would be people with disabilities, indigenous populations, um, scheduled casts, and then we've really now focused on refugees um, and other people affected by displacement. And the way we work is really through trying to build um, scaling through government and other institutions. Um, as a background, um, we began working with graduation in around 2012 um, with the United Nations um, High Commission for Refugees, piloting graduation in five areas um, in Africa and Latin America. Um, working with UNHCR to scale the graduation approach in displacement contexts, um, but then also realizing that um, organizations like the UN may not be the, the best movement for, for moving graduation forward, rather working with governments as well as large NGOs who are interested in the work. Really now looking at research and learning, scaling, and how to more um, adequately localize our programs um, for um, graduation. And you can see um, we have worked around the globe um, working um, to in graduation program. And just, just to kind of reiterate what was Block was saying is when we talk about graduation, we're looking at a sequenced and time-bound intervention that aims to help people living in extreme poverty, build resilience and engage in sustainable, sustainable livelihoods. So there are really three main areas to our graduation program that we try to make sure are, are built across the board. Um, and so why, why is graduation really relevant um, in displacement contexts. Um, as we know, there's an increasing number of forcibly displaced populations and, and there's decreasing funding, um, and as well as there's an um, increasing length of protracted programs. And what that means is we're looking at a focusing, programs are focusing on self-reliance and graduation as a livelihoods program really allows us to take that, that effort um, forward. And, and what's unique or, or not about graduation is really that it has been adapted for many contexts. It is so contextualized that you're able to build in programs that look at wage employment. You're able to build off of self-employment and they can be used um, as we've seen um, initially designed, but also in urban, peri-urban and um, for the work we're doing in settlement or camp situations. So when you're talking about refugee or kind of forced displacement sections, um, again, we follow, look at some of those similar areas that the ADD does around social protection, livelihood promotion, social empowerment, and financial inclusion. But when you're looking at people who are affected by displacement, there are additional vulnerabilities that they face. Um, for instance, they may lack legal and physical protection. Um, they may not know what services they have the right to um, or how to get them. Um, oftentimes we're working with Um, oftentimes people are arriving with little or no assets, which is typical for, for most people um, living in extreme poverty, but they may have had some things um, in the past. Um, and one of the things that, as we've seen, again, through pro programs is the importance of savings. Um, people often are ineligible to access financial services um, due to legal restrictions. Um, so helping or, um, people build up the documentation um, enable to be able to do that. Additionally, people face um, informal barriers around physical access, as well as discrimination. Um, and then finally, you'll see issues of social disempowerment um, around discrimination and little influence on programs that are really designed to impact um, their lives, which is how we ended up um, building off of the graduation approach um, and adapting it a little bit. Um, what we have done is kind of really in that inception phase is making sure we're really strong in the areas of assessment. assessment. So not just looking at market assessment, but also looking at socioeconomic assessment, um, the stakeholder assessment, and ensuring that we're bringing in all of the right people from the beginning. Um, we've also adapted the approach to include a few um, components that may not have been there in, in more traditional programs around referral services and linkages, as well as social capital and network engagement, um, because we found that these are areas where people affected by displacement 
may have more opportunity um, or may have more need for engagement around these areas to ensure they're getting the full access to support that they need in order to, to be successful in graduation. Um, just to share a few quick results, um, we have really seen um, a very high success of graduation programming. These are from our initial pilots um, with UNHCR, um, high graduation rates, increased um, income, um, and in increased diversification of income as well, which I think is really important for um, populations living in extreme poverty, that they aren't so reliant on just one income stream. Um, we also found um, that, that people are maintaining this post, post programs um, and, and have been very successful in that way as well. Um, we've recently conducted um, a randomized control trial with IPA in Uganda on another program um, on a USAID-funded graduation program, um, working with both refugees and host community members and have found really positive impacts on productive assets, household income, consumption, um, food security, um, but also subjective well-being. So people are feeling more satisfied. They're feeling that they're on their trajectory out of extreme poverty, which is really what we're trying to do with graduation programming. Um, so what I'd like to do is just take a minute and talk about some of the prerequisites that we have found um, through our over 12 years of working with graduation with people affected by displacement um, is that you really need to ensure that you have adequate funding for programs um, because there are many programs where you have only a year of funding. And if you're looking at um, humanitarian crisis, that challenges the situation of being able to ensure that you have continuity of programming. Um, you're also wanting to make sure that you have the right personnel um, who are able to commit and dedicate to working on graduation. Um, and they are being pulled in many different ways, which often happens in, in livelihoods programming. Um, the next step is around targeting. And from here, we're looking at it at two levels. One is geographic, um, where you're making sure that there are viable markets for people to participate. There is a high concentration of people living in displacement. And as we heard before, that people aren't extremely transient. So this is not the first entry point and they haven't, they're, they're not planning on staying. You want, you want some continuity of program. You want people to be able to commit to, to the work. Um, again, when you're looking at participant, you want people who are interested and capable of building sustainable livelihoods. Um, and again, a level of continuity that people are planning have been there. Again, we follow that six month rule and they may not be planning to move imminently. Um, obviously, there are, there are likelihood of some movement for refugees, um, but they're not, you know, on, on their way out the door as we start our programming. Um, then just uh, a few other prerequisites is around the socioeconomic assessment. We want to ensure that we're not just looking at people as being um, vulnerable, but also um, from a, a poverty perspective, that they, they really need all of the components of graduation. As we know, it's a very intensive um, program. And so we wanna make sure that we are designing it and offering it to the people who need all of those components. Um, and um, we want, but, and the reality is it may be a little bit different if you're looking at host community versus refugee communities. Um, the next step is that market assessment. Um, you want to identify the gaps and opportunities for um, refugee populations and it, contextualize it um, to the reality. And I think, again, that's something that you'll see in resettlement or displacement is that need to really contextualize, understand the market, um, understand the situation and figure out how you're able to adapt to their needs. Um, Again, for graduation, you, you aren't working in a bubble, you're really looking at other stakeholders. And so it's very important that you have a strong understanding of institutions, NGOs, and other partners who are in the context um, in order to ensure in that program. And that's both, I think, internal as well as external. So if you're working with programming where um, you have different protection or monitoring evaluation, or other staff, you want to involve them in that design so they they have buy-in and commitment to the work that we're doing. Um, and then finally, when we're talking about scale and sustainability, it's really important to include that from the very get-go. 
um, and build that into our design so that we're not designing um, just for the short term, but designing for how we can support long term. Um, and therefore, you want to build off of existing safety nets that may be available. Um, you want to understand how you can um, grow the program to include more people and respond to the needs of your population. Um, and you want to involve all of those key stakeholders in sustainability from the beginning. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ashana. Um, and now that we have um, been exposed to three different uh, case studies and three different approaches to graduation, it's time for a deeper dive into some of these issues. And we've asked our discussant, the Montesquieu, to facilitate this, um, this segment of the webinar uh, and reflect on some of these uh, uh, questions that our, our, our speakers raised and, and also pose some questions to our speakers. Now, just to introduce Oud, um, so she is the Financial Equity Community of Practice Facilitator um, at the Consultative Group to Assist the Poor, which is a, an in, independent think tank, which is widely known as CGAP. Now, Oud has worked at CGAP for, for 12 years, last as financial sector development specialist, and she, she led on the CGAP's um, flagship graduating the poorest and vulnerable segments work where she 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 was in charge of um, generating evidence on how graduation programs work. In 2017, Ode co-created a new global partnership within the World Bank Social Protection and Jobs Unit, um, which was called which is called Partnership for Economic Inclusion. Um, and she also worked as social development social protection specialist at the World Bank and also the World Bank's flagship report, State of Economic Inclusion 2021. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you all, and it's over to you. Thank you, Bob. It's a pleasure to be here, and I, I certainly enjoyed the presentations a lot. I want to facilitate some conversation between the speakers, and um, please feel free also, we'll have a Q&A session. I see there are questions already in the chat. Please continue uh, posting them there, and I'll, I'll try and feed them into some questions to the panelists. But first, I want to start uh, with uh, you, uh, Chi, and also Ricky, uh, um, to hear about um, some, some of the specifics of the Philippines and the Tamil Nadu projects. We, we heard about you, how these programs differed from a traditional ADB resettlement project. But I'd like to ask you, given you know so much also about a traditional graduation program, in what sense you think these programs also had different elements from a traditional graduation program? So traditionally, you do consumption support, you do savings, you might do an asset transfer or a cash transfer. Um, and there's continuous coaching. What was different from this um, in the Philippines, maybe first, and then uh, Tamil Nadu projects? Um, uh, over to you, Chi, and then uh, to Ricky. Thank you. Uh, first, I think an important context needs to be mentioned uh, that um, the, the resettlement uh, efforts in the Philippines are always supported in um, the resettlement action plan and there is already a menu of services that are identified in the resettlement action plan that households that will be affected and displaced by uh, the construction of the railway could avail of and um, these these include um, not necessarily consumption uh, support no but uh, it's it's similar to a consumption support when they have to be moved to the new location and that's made available when they are ready to relocate um also several uh entitlements no uh to replace uh, lost assets and uh, uh livelihood support no uh, so what how does it differ um uh, several adjustments needed to be made, no, and no, which would differentiate it from the traditional GA, no. For example, uh, instead of the usual um, assessments where you involve the communities in identifying the participants, we employed uh, a rapid baseline survey 
that made use of the data that the DOTR or the government already collected, no? And, and use the same criteria identified by the government to identify those that will be selected. And they include uh, indicators for income poverty, for non-income di di uh, indicators of vulnerability. And we then devise a scoring tool to select the top 1,500 most vulnerable households, uh, which we think uh, would be uh, the perfect number you know, that could be supported by the available resources. We also adjusted uh, the usual graduation criteria to involve a number of indicators that are linked to resettlement outcomes. You know? For example, access to safe and decent shelter, benefits from government assistance for livelihoods, and integration in their new community. Part of the menu of services also included facilitating access to uh, information uh, and, and uh, services on socialized housing and, and other options because not all of them will qualify for socialized housing. Um, and and uh, we, we help the household meet the requirements for uh, socialized housing and, and compensation benefits. Then rather than the, sorry, so rather than the upfront uh, uh, cash assets transfer, we instead um, link households to resources for livelihoods from NGAs and non-government partners. Uh, because I, as I said in my presentation, um, there are many available uh, resources for, for livelihoods, no? and we, uh, we made use of that. Uh, for social empowerment, the focus was on strengthening the homeowners association that was uh, that were organized already by government to prepare them for resettlement. Um, I think it's also important to mention that um, the GA in the context of the MCRP was implemented uh, when the resettlement activities were still on. They have not been uh, resettled. Uh, in other words, so it was during the transition phase that we implemented the GA. Thanks. Over to you, Riki. And can I ask you also, hearing about uh, hearing Chi uh, talk, I was wondering also uh, if you can speak to some of the particularities about trust and maybe program participants, you know, being more um, uh, needing to build up more trust with the program because of the program-induced uh, displacements, um, if you want to talk about that. Right, thanks. Um, Odd, I think I'll be brief because um, she had covered a lot of the things, but I think for participants who are not familiar with graduation or resettlement or are only familiar with one side, I think when you put them together, the idea is that you have a framework, a better framework from a resettle per resettlement perspective of delivering um, certain, certain pillars of the graduation um, approach. I think what is very important to understand here is that our project has several peculiarities. The relocation and the success of the relocation is the project itself, right? So this is not building a bridge um, and, and people are displaced, but this is actually moving people. So the reason why we, we have the graduation approach in this project is because it's very clear that the objective of the graduation approach is for people to thrive or people to get out of poverty. That's a very important objective. If they thrive in the relocation area and get out of poverty in the process, then they will stay in the relocation site and not have to go back to their old locations, which are climate climate prone. That's usually the failure of affordable housing projects that move informal settlers. The second thing that I want to also discuss is that in, in a traditional resettlement planning, the main objective, and this is ADB's SPS, is to ensure that they are not worse off. So same conditions, but this is not our objective when you tag in the graduation, you really want them to be in a better place. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think, very important. And what, what changes when you're just doing a, a regular resettlement process, I think it's 
you know, using the framework makes you really look at things in a holistic manner. You develop proper timelines and you know, the sequence of events is very, very important. In resettlement planning, usually we lose sight of that. You know, the, res the asset transfer happens later in, in, in the period, but that's more important actually than the other assistants because that sets you up with your livelihood. The constant coaching coaches presence is also very important because you have been relocated. So this is not an ordinary graduation uh, approach either. You are actually relocated. You need those coaches more than you know when you do your graduation approach to for poverty reduction, which is on site. Usually, there's no relocation involved, so it covers a lot of pluses. And oh, there were many questions, and I want to attempt maybe in a second um, to to answer some of them. But you know, this graduation program is a pilot. We first convinced the government. That's a very important thing. We had. Um, uh, Lauren um, through financing from um, Karen and from Lainey, we had Lauren from BRAC explain to the government what graduation approach is. And that's that was a firm basis for us applying it because this is, as one of the questions raised, is, is a part of the loan proceeds. It's not a grant. They're, the government is spending for this because they want to have, you know, their success in relocating people is having people stay. And that's the reason why the graduation approach is very attractive to them. So I, I, it's one thousand seven hundred pilot that they will apply to all the six thousand that we that we um will be relocating um in the future. Thanks, Odd. Excellent. Thanks a lot, Ricky. Shoshana, let me turn to you and and actually ask you. I mean, for you also. How does how how does a resettlement induced uh, well how does a graduation program in a resettlement uh, pr uh, um, context differ from a graduation program in a refugee context, which Trickle Up has more uh, experience with? We heard from Ricky maybe the timeline, the level of preparedness, but also maybe the resentment. Can, can you comment a bit about that? Thank you. Yeah, I think, thank you. I mean, I think what's going to be really different is potentially who those stakeholders are and the people that you need to really engage in your programming, um, because you're, you're looking, you're, you're, they're both forced displacement, but it's forced in a different way in the sense that you're actually, you're telling them exactly where they're going, whereas refugees are more traditionally walking and kind of making, not a choice, but a, a more involved in their choice of where they're going. Um, and that they have decided that they want to make that, that decision. Whereas in a resettlement, you're actually picking people up and saying, you need to move to this. And I think in doing that, um, there's trauma in a different way um, that you need to look into. And there's challenges of resentment, as you say, as well as ensuring kind of that people are understanding why you're taking those decisions. Um, and that you're trying that that the program needs to potentially involve those stakeholders in a different way to allow the participants to understand the background of how that is done. Um, just and again, I think this is what's great about all graduation is you're always contextualizing. Um, and so, but making sure when you are looking at resettlement that you're bringing that that perspective of how where the people are coming from and how you can adapt to address their challenges and needs. Thanks a lot, uh, Shoshana. Chi and, and Ricky, um, back to you uh, for, for questions. I, I heard earlier, Chi, you were saying, you know, one of the things that you do differently in this context is, you know, the access to shelter, etc., but also making sure that people are integrated into local communities. And I want to ask you both a bit more about that. Um, can you can you tell us a bit more about how do you involve the host communities or the the people from the places where people are being relocated into the projects of uh, how you did this both in the Philippines and then in Tamil Nadu um, and any lessons learned around the engagement of, of the local community in the relocation site. Um, Chi, you're on mute. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. All right. One of the unique things, I think, uh, with the MCRP in the Philippines is that uh, except for one um, city, 
uh, the city of Manila, all the others are um, are are not really relocating outside of their cities, and that means the um, the uh, the risk of of them becoming uh, disconnected from local their local governments lesser, no, and and so we didn't have much problem around that area. For Manila, it was a challenge because. By the time we exited, uh, Manila hasn't firmed up uh, its relocations, uh, relocation site. So it's quite, it was quite difficult um, to, to arrange for, uh, for us no, to, to bridge the households to the uh, area we, uh, we attempted no, to, uh, to arrange that they be brought to the, uh, to the relocation uh, site, but it wasn't ready by the time we exited. Um, and, but we were assured by the DOTR uh, that uh, the residents or the households will be uh, will be linked to the new LGU, and uh, that they will be given the chance to see their their housing site before they are relocated. Um, and on 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 the part of Tamil Nadu, um, the relocation sites were. Um, uh, fortunately, quite well known. Um, on the other hand, they were also greenfield sites. See, um, as opposed to the um, the railway project in the Philippines, the objective of all resettlement planning is to really relocate them as close to their former site. But Tamil Nadu, the Tamil Nadu project has a twist. They are in climate hazard prone areas, so they needed to be re relocated to a distance where that climate hazard. Um, cease to exist. So this this can have host communities, or they may not have you know very well established host communities. We have sites where actually the host community is also another relocation um, program. But it's very important, um, and I think the importance of this um, is is in terms of really ensuring that we have an understanding of the host community as a host as a host in terms of services and also in terms of opportunities for livelihood um, livelihood so this was well studied by the graduation team and all these linkages were made etc and very important to bring people to the site even before the actual um, relocation happens and that's the reason why i pulled in my last slide um, where we always bring people as the construction happens because we can also uh, and, and this is a message for resettlement not just for graduation but um, I think it's very important that you do your course correction in consultation with the people. So, you know, as the sites were being built, they were saying, oh, if this is where you intend to have the market, you know, our products may be too, too, um, too, too much and the space is too small. So we had to rethink some of these things, right? And the livelihood center, the number of people who can be there. So that's been our experience. I do want to underscore that one important thing, and not necessarily on your question on host community, is the importance of having the CSOs. So the civil society organizations actually have been our link um, to, to the host communities as well as to the people. So, yeah. Thanks so much, Ricky. I, I, I think there's so much to discuss, and I, I'd be dying to also ask Shoshana about this on the... On, uh, on uh, involving hosts, but maybe let's keep that for the Q&A. Um, I have a last question for you, Shoshana. You had a really interesting slide on some of the adaptations of a classic graduation and some of the prerequisites. I wanted to ask you, it's a bit technical, but given the specificities of a refugee in a resettlement context, how do you do the monitoring? There might be some sensitivities. Um, well, there are some sensitivities about, you know, people's data and particularly in these contexts, people might be, um, you know, particularly vulnerable. Um, what are some things to keep in mind? And that will be my last question before Bob, I think, uh, we'll move back to you. Thanks, I think. Sure, thank you. I mean, I think honestly, when you're looking at monitoring evaluation, it, it's very similar. Um, and actually, I think that the biggest thing when you're when you're doing this is to associate your monitoring evaluation with your graduation criteria. And therefore, it becomes probably a little bit less sensitive um, because you're really aligning it with um, participants' personal goals as well, and so that they don't necessarily feel that you're being intrusive. Um, I think one of the things when you are looking at programming um, for working with refugees is the importance of over-targeting um, in terms of how you're trying to reach numbers. 
um, because there are as much as you try not to have people who are on the move, uh, who are going to move, people will. So more people will go home. Some people will be resettled. Um, so when you're when you're trying to look at understanding the impact of your program, you're wanting to allow for some over targeting. Um, but we haven't had a lot of issues in terms of monitoring of, of safety data because a lot of it comes down to your relationship with them that you build through the comprehensive programming. Thanks a lot, Bob. Uh, back over to you. Thank you so much for moderating this session. Lots of interesting um, details that are emerging. Um, and just to continue um, with that, um, there are quite a few questions, very interesting questions. And what I'm trying to do is to um, sort of just, just pose a few um, a, a few questions that go to the sort of core of, of the, the graduation approach. And one question is, is about the the risk of falling back into vulnerability. So to what extent graduation means that you actually exit from poverty or you, 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 your vulnerability is reduced to the extent that you that is becoming sustainable. And have you noticed any of that in your experience? And uh, and with that, the question is, who actually benefits from the graduation approach? Can we assume that all, you know, people, all people in the affected communities, they, they equally benefit from from the graduation assistance and who benefits who doesn't can we generalize can we come up with some um key sort of um features that that can speak to that um i can start by speaking a little to the question on vulnerability and then happy to hear from the presenters or from karen laney or others uh, who've been critical to this work as well uh, it's a it's a really good question. And I think looking at falling back into vulnerability, both during the course of the program and after the program, so dividing it into those two. Now, during the course of the program, the program has many measures to be able to identify and address those vulnerabilities, which are often caused by shocks or operational challenges. And let me give some examples of that. In the Philippines, Padayon project, not presented here, but a project we did with graduation in social protection, some livestock that people had picked fell sick to diseases. Or currently, we are doing a program in Mongolia where some households are struggling with starting their livelihoods due to a lack of working capital or other shocks that may have that, that, that they may have faced in the families. So the program team, especially the coaches or field staff, which is like one of the most important aspects to the success of such a program, are working with the households and the respective government departments to resolve these issues, such as by supporting insurance for assets, using existing programs to provide additional support, in some cases like a substitute asset or working capital. Uh, and these are some ways that they try to prevent or to support households if they fall back into vulnerabilities. And then both during and after the program, again, due to shocks or other challenges, the other way that such programs try to ensure sustainability is by establishing linkages to existing support mechanisms because these programs are time bound, they will come to an end. But one of the key ways to support households is by linking them to available services, such as in Mongolia for, for households that have picked greenhouse vegetable growing activity, they are being linked more closely to the agriculture officers at the village and at the district level to be able to provide them support with their existing mechanisms. And those linkages come in handy after the program has ended as well. And just one last point before I end would be that graduation programs support households in building or moving towards better resilience and sustainable livelihoods. They may still be applicable for social assistance. Uh, a graduation is not necessarily graduating out of poverty in that case, but more to help them move in a path that leads to these livelihoods and resilience. And that is an important difference that we like to highlight to governments while working on them. But please requesting any presenters or more people to add. Thanks very much, Palak. So for the interest of time, we have about seven minutes left. Can I ask you if there if there's anyone who would like to compliment, just um, if you could do a very quick intervention and then we we have another two rounds of questions. Maybe I can add, uh, Bob, just um, shortly. One of the things that we've learned, and, and Karen um, uh, knows this very well in Cambodia, is that um, there, there are people, of course, not every resettlement exercise will lead to positive outcomes. There will be people who will not be able to thrive. But having a graduation approach 
um, basically um, tries to fill in these gaps. One of the biggest gaps we had in the Cambodia Railway Project was that um, you had near poor people who end up becoming poor because of uh, because of uh, an extraordinary event. For example, the birth of a child or falling sick, uh, the breadwinner being uh, being sick. Um, they had already been thriving, but they they become poor because of this extraordinary event. And that's the reason why, you know, the stress on financial inclusion, I think, um, in improves the resilience very much. Um, and so looking at all this and how each of these components improve resilience is not a guarantee of 100% success, but it definitely reduces all those risks. Thank you very much, Ricky. And that leads me to another question, which is given how time and effort the labor intensive is the graduation approach. So, so much <clears throat> the, the sort of designing and implementing requires painstaking efforts. Um, can we actually apply it in an ad hoc manner? So there's, a, there's an interesting question that said, can you actually use this approach in refugee camps or people who need immediate support? Um, um, I'll jump in there Sorry. With, with the refugee camps. I mean, I, th I think that the challenge with graduation is, is I wouldn't say you want to do things ad hoc. Um, you really want to plan um, and make sure that you're understanding that context, because that's what's so important about the graduation approach is that you're not just kind of throwing a solution here or there at it, but you're building off of uh, a well kind of planned program that uses this sequence and time bound approach that, that really addresses that multi-dimensional need. So just trying to do one thing here and there, I think um, is going to be challenged. When you're looking at refugees, you 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 also want to think about what is that long-term need. And by building in all of the, the support systems and programs that address their, their multi-dimensional challenges, you're able to do that. Thanks, Shoshana. Ricardo, did you want to follow up on that? Yes, no, I, I actually was going to say something very similar, that the graduation approach is really a well-timed, well-sequenced thing that requires planning. On the other hand, we also have um, cases where we have no choice. There's an emergency, for example, those displaced by an earthquake or a flood. I think what we can do is look at the elements of graduation and see what can be delivered up front. For example, linkage to services where they have to be relocated. It's not going to be a graduation approach, clearly, but... I think because you're looking at what is required, um, you can do it in an emergency, but you know, just try to deliver what is most required. As I said, like linking them when they have arrived at that location. Thank you very much. And the third question is really, it's about the sort of the political economy of these and, and the willingness of governments to engage with this approach, given that it's costly, given that it requires a lot of preparation, so in your particular case in Tamil Nadu, there was a clear um, decision to, to use this for resettlement. So the question is, um, where do you see the prospect opportunities for more engagement with graduation, particularly in resettlement context, but also uh, generally? Yes, um, definitely for housing projects, I think it should be um, uh, a main feature or a permanent feature. In other contexts where you have resettlement, I think, again, it is going to determine how successful your relocation and your resettlement is. But the sustainability is something that we need to explain. That's where your cost comes in. Um, it's very easy at the very immediate, um, you know, if you put enough resources very immediately, you can restore everything that was lost via compensation, via grants, via allowances, etc. But will it be sustainable? This is the difference in the graduation approach. There is more focus on having a sustainable um, sustainable improvement in, in livelihood and lives. So I think that's what needs to be underscored. In the end, informal settlers will go back to where they came from if they are unable to thrive in the location that they have been moved to. That's no different whether you're doing affordable housing or just a standard relocation. Thanks very much, Ricky. And, and really, we need to close very soon. And then one more question. I think it's for Shoshana, really. So um, uh, somebody from Nigeria is actually asking whether the graduation approach is more feasible in refugee programming rather than IDP, internally displaced uh, persons programming. Have you, have you seen any, have you observed any, any uh, particular um, elements here? I haven't really noticed a, a major difference. I think when you're looking at IDPs, 
the, the benefit is that you can actually build off of more social safety nets if they do exist because your your participants are um, re, uh, you know citizens of the country. Um, I think part of the challenge does become of what is the interest in supporting these programs. Um, but when you are looking at IDPs, potentially you're looking at more of a likelihood of uh, hopefully of, of a return situation, whereas some refugees are, are, are more likely to, to resettle into your location, whereas IDPs, depending on the situation, may need to may, may end up returning. Um, and I think one of the things to think about is what is that long-term uh, impact that you're trying to have? And the idea is that while graduation is an 18 to 30 month program, um, after that program is over, it isn't bad if people go back to where they were, where they, for us, not, not in a resettlement situation, but for our programs, it's not bad if they take their skills and learn and move it to um, one of the most durable solution opportunities, be it um, their their initial home or to their their resettled location. But again, that's unique to us, where we we want people to potentially find those durable solutions. Thanks very much, Ashana. Um, so on that, um, I would like to close this webinar and um, um, and thank our participants, um, our speakers, and I also uh, thank our audience. Um, so this is. Um, this was an attempt to 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 share some of the the lessons from our um, experiences from these innovative pilots and our engagement um, in the graduation programs, as well as to learn more about the graduation approach in uh, forced displacement settings. And and this is only the beginning of the conversation. Obviously, we would like to share this information, but also we would like to ask lots and lots of questions to find out. Um, the, the nuances and peculiarities about, you know, how the graduation approach works, for whom, in what circumstances, how, and that's how we can um, enrich our understanding as well as um, hope to enhance our policy interventions with that. So thank you again um, uh, for, for, for sharing your time with us. Um, and um, as our, our, our speakers here, uh, Balak, Chi, Shoshana, Rick, and our discussant Oud. Thank you very much. And thank you so much to, um, to socialprotection.org for hosting this webinar for you. All the best. Bye-bye. Thank you, Owen.